Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Van Maren Show on LifeSiteNews.com. Today, we're going to be taking a deep dive into the World Health Organization. What is the World Health Organization? To what extent is it influenced by China? Is it a force for evil in the world? And what can we do about it? That's coming right up. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Van Maren Show. My name is Jonathan Van Maren, and today we're going to be talking to Rebecca Oss, the Associate Director of Research for CFAM. Some of you might remember that I had an hour-long conversation with Austin Roos of CFAM some time ago, and now we're having on their expert on the World Health Organization to take a look at what is actually going on at the international level. A lot of you have been hearing about the WHO and the UN and Chinese influence, and pro-abortion influence, and we really wanted to unpackage what's taking place so that we all get a bit of a a better understanding of of what's going on. Uh, Rebecca earned her doctorate in genetics and molecular biology at Emory University. Uh, She's written for Human Life International as a fellow of HLI America, and she also currently serves as a contributing editor for HLI. So she joins us to break down the World Health Organization, what we need to know, and what we can do about it. Just for starters, because a lot of our our viewers and listeners don't really know much about international institutions, because to be honest, a lot of us don't pay attention to them until they affect our lives in some way. So I'll admit to being pretty ignorant about a lot of the, a lot of the things that the WHO does. So maybe just for starters, could you explain to us a bit about what the WHO is and what it does? Sure. Um, so, I mean, the, the World Health Organization um, is, you know, it's the basically the health agency of the, the UN. And as you know, the UN was founded in the post World War II um, period, with you know, in, in an increasingly globalized world. Um, you know, the the various agencies of the UN do different things, but the idea was that we need a place where all the nations can come together and exchange ideas and information. Obviously, trying to prevent another world war. That's, you know, obviously the function of the Security Council. Um, And when it comes to global health, you know, particularly when it comes to infectious disease, there is, you know, obviously a need to exchange information. Um, You can't just handle these things at a national level because obviously viruses don't, you know, they don't know borders. Mm -hmm. And as people are increasingly traveling, um, there's, you know, a need for, uh, to have, you know, a way of exchanging that information, a central hub for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly in terms of disseminating best practices, in terms of nutrition, in terms of, you know, disease prevention as well, it's good to have a way of exchanging information. Um, you know, and there have been some very big successes in terms of, you know, eradicating diseases that the WHO has gotten a lot of goodwill from the, the global community for. Um, but as with any international institution, the problem becomes when it becomes politicized. Um, you know, the, the way that the UN operates, you know, is that obviously it has its own sort of bureaucracy, but it also is governed by the member states, the countries that are its members who come together and negotiate and come to consensus on issues. And so the idea is that you want to have a consensus driven, you know, organization where, you know, it's not the, the, the rich or the large countries necessarily overpowering the smaller ones. Everyone has one vote in the UN. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to the World Health Organization, its governing body is called the World Health Assembly, you know, which again is, you know, government officials from member states coming together and agreeing on resolutions and, you know, courses of action. And the way that the World Health Organization is funded is that, you know, there is what's called sort of assessed dues, which is where, you know, in accordance with what nation's GDP is, they, you know, they are assessed a certain uh, contribution that they're supposed to make for the maintenance of the organization. Obviously, you know, poorer countries can't give as much, but, you know, we all have our buy-in. But then there's also voluntary contributions, which nations can make. And a lot of times those are earmarked for specific projects. And as you can imagine, the countries that have more money are more able to give those voluntary contributions. And over time, the budget of the World Health Organization has been shifting more and more toward reliance on these voluntary contributions. And so there's this dynamic where both the World Health Organization is seeking this money, you know, um, and also countries who have particular agendas and particular projects they want to see done are more likely to give the World Health Organization those funds and say, we want you to do this. And of course, 
when a country is trying to promote, you know, a controversial agenda, particularly in the health space, and abortion is certainly one of those issues, you know, rather than that country just taking that money and doing the project themselves, if they can collaborate with the World Health Organization, then you get the, you know, the credibility and the goodwill that people associate with that organization attached to it. And so that this creates, you know, obviously a, a political dynamic that's not great. Right. Um, and of course, you know, we've seen when it comes to the, the recent coronavirus pandemic, the, the problem of political, you know, polit politiz politicization with that as well, you know, where, you know, unfortunately, the World Health Organization for, the, you know, long after it was credible was basically repeating the talking points of the Chinese government. Um, and so, you know, when it becomes too much under the thumb of various large and powerful or wealthy countries, you know, we see where the conflict of interest comes. So. I, I, I think it was last year I had Obianuju Ikoka on this podcast, a Nigerian pro-life activist. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of her. She wrote a, a wonderful book called uh, Target Africa, um, Neocolonialism in, in the 21st Century. And she talks uh, about all these international institutions and the extent to which they're being used as tools by nations with a lot of money and an agenda. And she talks about how foreign aid is now coming with strings attached, which is the name of her documentary as well. And basically says that a lot of poorer countries, in exchange for aid, they're forced to accept practices that many of them uh, find morally questionable. So in your experience, to what degree is, is the World Health Organization becoming a tool of, of the richer nations who have a very specific agenda uh, for developing countries that those developing countries might not actually wish to participate in, but find themselves pressured financially to do so? Well, I can certainly say that, I mean, as you alluded to earlier, when you live in a, a very wealthy developed country, the United States, Canada, and much of Western Europe, you don't feel the effect of these institutions as much. You know, right. your own government is where you go to for services and, you know, governance. And, and so if you are in a country that's poor, a country that's an aid recipient, you are much more downstream of what these international organizations are doing. A lot more of your, you know, your health care, a lot more of your supplies are going to have the logos of, you know, either, you know, other countries, USAID, you know, from the American people or from, you know, the UN agencies. Mm -hmm. And so what happens at the UN is going to impact the countries that are, you know, developing countries more directly. And so what gets agreed to there is going to hit them the most. And of course, what is agreed to at the UN is being affected by, by who's who has the money so there's there's obviously sort of that that downstream effect going on um i mean certainly we know there's the long history of population control and that's hit you know countries in africa and, and the rest of the developing world very hard um you know and and of course much of that we don't we see coming out of the united nations population fund or the unfpa which is sort of where that work is is uh, located but obviously, these agencies all work in collaboration with each other. Oftentimes, you know, the World Health Organization and UNFPA and UNICEF and all these, you know, the various bodies of the UN collaborate and, and, and work in tandem, as well as the Human Rights Office, you know, uh, the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights in Geneva. And so oftentimes, these things are happening in collaboration. So it's not just one agency doing something in, you know, in isolation from the rest of the system. Um, you know, when it comes to the abortion issue, obviously, um, well, perhaps not obviously, but there isn't an internationally agreed human right to abortion that has never been established at all. Um, for the last more than 20 years, there's been a consensus that is that there, you know, the law on abortion in any given country is for that country to determine. Um, the agreement in 1994, where this was established, also said, and where it is legal, it should be safe. Obviously, safe meaning that the mother doesn't die. Obviously, it can't be safe yeah. for the child. Um, but so the World Health Organization, you know, it has interpreted this guidance not only to ensure, you know, that there are ways in, of doing it, quote unquote, safely, but they've also taken it upon themselves to issue policy guidance on, you know, basically the idea being that if you want to get rid of, quote unquote, unsafe abortion, the only alternative is to provide safe abortion. Right. You know, the idea that people might be persuaded against it entirely it doesn't really enter into it. And so, you know, from there we see a lot of guidance documents coming out of the World Health Organization that are not only urging countries to expand the legal grounds and liberalize their laws, but also giving them the tools and the, you know, the guidance on how to do it. Um, and so, you know, obviously that's been an issue um, because in particular since the, the uh, 
the wider range of medical abortion, you know, abortion by pills as opposed to surgical abortion. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen a big shift toward practices where it, the, the idea is to sort of take it out of the medical establishment as much as possible. So there's been guidance from the WHO saying, you know, we should expand the provider pool, not just doctors, but nurses, midwives, and so on, you know, bringing more people in on it to maximize access. Also, um, we've seen the World Health Organization's essential medicines list that they yeah. put out, which is, you know, uh, in now includes abortion drugs. There is still a, a note that says where nationally appropriate, you know, but, but essentially it's, you know, the idea is that countries have to stock these drugs. And they've also more recently put out guidance talking about doing abortion under the, you know, the, the rubric of self-care. As in, you don't even need to involve a doctor hardly at all. Just get the women the pills and, you know, give them, again, World Health Organization approved guidance. And so some of these people who in countries where abortion is illegal are distributing these pills are able to say, well, we're doing this in line with what the WHO has said. And so they're giving cover for a lot of these practices. Right. So, so how much influence does the World Health Organization actually have on abortion laws in other countries and things like that? Because especially right now. Um, and, and I'm sure you've seen this online, but the discussion on, on organizations like the World Health Organization are so polarized that it's difficult to sort of peel the onion and understand what's happening. So we know that, that the World Health Organization is pro-abortion. As you mentioned, they, they've, they've listed it as an essential service. They, they've, they've put out uh, uh, announcements encouraging people to, to uh, really uh, take care of, of abortion practices during the pandemic. But to what extent do they actually have a, a, an influence? Is it just that we think they have an influence because they're an international body? Or do they genuinely have an impact on countries where abortion is illegal or restricted? restricted. Well, I guess I could answer that in a couple of ways. Um, first and foremost, you know, it is not in their mandate at all to pressure countries to change their laws, right. nor any UN agency. That you know, the, the laws on abortion are to be determined by countries themselves. That is the level of consensus. So that at least anything they're doing to pressure countries on their laws is outside their mandate. So that has to be said. Um, in a, uh, the last few years, the WHO has put up a, um, a database of abortion laws and policies by country, which again is an interesting thing for them to do given that this is not really their mandate. Mm -hmm. And they've linked, um, they have a database within that of the recommendations coming out of the treaty monitoring bodies over in the human rights section in Geneva, where they have those treaty bodies, you know, that basically monitor compliance with human rights treaties that a country's agreed to. Those treaty bodies have gone outside their mandate and pressured countries on abortion laws for the last couple decades. And so the WHO is now maintaining a database of all the times when these treaty bodies have told countries to change their laws. And so for some reason, the WHO is now keeping list of all the laws and all the places where the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights and its sub subsidiary bodies have pressured countries on this. And it pretty ma much makes clear the reason for this is to, you know, enable advocacy, essentially, to, you know, help abortion advocates to know exactly who to go after and with what. Um, now, these, these treaty bodies' recommendations are non-binding. Right. Nations are bound by the treaties themselves and the text of the treaties. The recommendations from these monitoring bodies are, are not binding in the same way. But there have been cases where activist courts within countries have cited those opinions you know, in changing their abortion laws. So to that extent, they get legitimacy. Um, but, you know, certainly there is an effort to create, you know, a de facto human right to abortion, and this is all feeding into that. So it's not unimportant. So the World Health Organization obviously can't tell a country it has to change its laws and that country doesn't have to comply, and no UN agency can do that. But to the extent that there are activists within countries, they will quickly point to these international institutions, you know, as a reason why they should change their laws. So it, it does increase the pressure on governments, um, both within and without. Um, but what the World Health Organization can also be a part of is to the extent that laws are still in place against abortion, either entirely or, or just restricting, you know, under what grounds, the World Health Organization can certainly provide cover for those who want to skirt around the law. So yeah. by putting these drugs on essential medicines list, this ensures that the drugs are available and can be distributed, you know, either, you know, on the black market or, you know, in, in various different ways, perhaps prescribed, you know, one of the drugs is, is originally prescribed for gastric ulcers. And, you know, so people have 
had ready access to it, even outside of a clinical setting. And so the idea, you know, is if you can't get it le to be legal, you can at least make it quote unquote safe right. and widely accessible. And, you know, we've seen a lot of this in particular in Latin America, where these pills have become very widely available and WHO guidance that basically tells you what to do. And, you know, obviously there will be complications inevitably, but it's, you know, deemed to be safer than certain alternative methods. Mm -hmm. So, so you, yeah, it's part of it is pressuring countries to change their laws. And part of it is coming up with ways to get around the law by making sure that the means and the, you know, the guidance is available regardless. So let's get into the political weeds just a little bit, because I know a lot of people want to know right now. It, so this is animating, for example, the conservative leadership race here in Canada. Uh, it's animating a lot of uh, American politics right now as well. Um, the ex what is, to what extent is China uh, sort of pulling a lot of the strings at the WHO? To what extent do they have a major influence? You see a lot of a lot of uh, theories flying around, and so I was hoping that we could just unpackage the extent to which um, the theories that that China is pulling the strings of the WHO uh, is true or not true. What what would your take be on that? Well, you know, again. Uh, my sort of focus area is on, you know, obviously the pro-life side of things. Um, I mean, it, there's no doubt that China, as one of the most populous countries and the, you know, one of the largest countries in the world, has, you know, obviously a lot of influence. Um, certainly the previous uh, director of the WHO was from China. Um, and China was definitely backing uh, Dr. Tedros, you know, who is, you know, the Ethiopian current director of, of uh, the WHO. So his... Um, getting that position was definitely, you know, partly due to the Chinese influence. So um, I, I would just say that, yeah, I mean, they have, they are a, a powerful player in any international setting. Um, and, you know, the, again, it, it becomes, you know, one of those issues where the politicization of the WHO at any level is going to be a problem. Right. Um, and the degree to which it's taking its orders from single countries as opposed to, you know, the collective will of the, the World Health Assembly, the, the, you know, the, all the different nations is, is troubling, uh, to say the least, especially when it comes to compromising global health. And so I, I don't have, um, I mean, m much has been written about this. I, I guess it's not, you know, in my specific area, but... What I would say is that the same kinds of things that are compromising the response to COVID-19 are also at work and have been at work for some time when it comes to the issues around the life issues, um, right. both right. in terms of, you know, the WHO promoting abortion, which is outside of its mandate, but also in terms of some of the ways that maternal and child health falls through the cracks. Well, and, and, and one of the pieces of evidence that's been put forward, and I'm sure you saw the video, millions of people did, of, of, of one of the World Health uh, Organization directors refusing to admit that Taiwan was an, an independent jurisdiction in an interview. Um, he, it, it was brought up consistently, and he responded by just referring to China as if Taiwan was still part of China, which um, it really feeds into this idea that they're pulling a, a lot of the strings. If you can get a guy to sort of vanish an entire independent jurisdiction because uh, presumably it's it's the financial the financial um thing that 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 is making him do that but what what is your take then on 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 Donald Trump promising to to defund the the World Health Organization and his statements that the money could be could be used far better elsewhere well i think that's an that, that i mean it's it's heartening in a certain sense because obviously the world um the, the united states has defunded other un entities in the past um you know and, and in fact bringing up the issue of, of taiwan uh, one of the other big thorny issues at the un is the you know israel and palestine situation right one state or two and and so obviously the us has um particularly cited the anti-Israel bias of UN bodies as a reason for defunding or pulling out of them, you know, as when the UN or when the US pulled out of the Human Rights Council in Geneva because of their, you know, repetitive anti-Israel uh, resolutions. And also that's the reason why they pulled out of funding UNESCO, the uh, agency that focuses on education and, you know. So there's certainly a, a, a history of the US defunding you know, or removing themselves as members of different bodies at the UN for various different reasons. And there's also precedent for the US defunding 
agencies due to the abortion issue. Um, you know, obviously when um, the U.S. has defunded the UNFPA, the United Nations Population Fund, that's partly due to their promotion of abortion and partly due to their um, collaboration with China during the one-child policy. Um, so certainly withholding funds from an organization that's doing things that are outside of its mandate and in opposition to U.S. foreign policy is something we've done many times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the from our standpoint, you know, the fact that the president talked about defunding WHO because of the coronavirus response also raises the question of perhaps we should look at all the reasons maybe that we shouldn't be funding them or why we could, you know, things we might do to try and redirect them toward, you know, not doing pro-abortion work as well. Mm -hmm. So some people would make the case that because the World Health Organization is so influenced by those who are, are contributing most generously financially to it, that the uh, U.S. pulling their funding will simply result in China having even more influence because they're one of the sole big donors. What would your response to that be? Well, that is always the question, and this was something that was brought up when the U.S. pulled out of the Human Rights Council. The question is, is it better to have a seat at the table and be a moderating voice or to basically take your ball and go home? Right. Um, and, I, you know, to be honest, it's, it's complicated. There's, you know, to some extent, the U.S., having being the largest donor to the WHO gives it an outsized voice there. But also there's a lot, I mean, when it comes certainly to the way that we allocate funding, um, you know, the Mexico city policy or protecting life in global health assistance policy that president Trump uh, put in place and, and expanded to all of global health doesn't apply to multilateral institutions. Mm. So perhaps, you know, starting by closing up that loophole on the U S side might be a, a good place to start. But then there's also the question of where it does our funding to the WHO go? I mean, there's the assessed contribution. That's, you know, sort of the core contribution to the running of the place. And then there's the voluntary contributions, which we also make. Um, certainly, there are certain outfits within the WHO that are more problematic than others. And, you know, one would be um, the HRP, which is the Human Reproduction Project, which is it's actually sort of housed in the WHO, but it is collaborating with UNFPA, UNESCO, uh, UNICEF, different uh, UN agencies. Um, and that particular, that particular umbrella body covers the abortion issue as well as maternal and child health and various other related issues that have to do with, you know, reproduction. And the U.S. has been one of the funders of that, as have several, you know, largely Western European, you know, nations that have been very much promoting abortion. And in fact, there are single large uh, civil society partners in the International Planned Parenthood Federation. Right. And so pulling our funding just from that body alone would be an important statement, um, you know, and would certainly be in line with previous actions the U.S. government has taken, such as when um, they partially defunded some organizations within the Organization of American States, the OAS, because of their promoting abortion in Latin America, in right. accordance with what's called the Siljander Amendment, which... Um, basically is a prohibition on U.S. funding being used to lobby for or against abortion in foreign countries. So in line with that precedent, presumably they could, you know, apply that to the WHO as well. So one of the one of the things I wanted to ask you is, is it's quite overwhelming just for your average pro-life person to look at these international institutions, the United Nations. Um, you've got the World Health Organization, all these subsidiary organizations, even the EU and to see every one of these organizations um, thoroughly infiltrated and, and more or less colonized by abortion activists. And it seems to many people that these international institutions are inevitably going to be used as a tool uh, to promote evil worldwide. And it, it can become kind of uh, sort of overwhelming and depressing to consider the fact that no, no, no uh, sooner are these things set up um, when Planned Parenthood has a seat at the table, right? International Planned Parenthood, Marie Stopes. Um, the Gates Foundation, you name it. Suddenly they all have a seat at the table and and it seems like their view uh, of, of, of so-called reproductive health immediately takes precedent. How how should, you know, your average ordinary pro-life person view these international institutions? Should we look at them as sort of rotten to the core and, and we should be defunding them and hoping they kind of topple? Or, uh, you know, are they enormous tools for good at times? Or are they sort of a, a mix of, of, of good and bad? Because I know, like, this is... This is sort of your line of work. This is what CFAM does. So how are we to view these institutions? Well, I think first and foremost, we have to view them with, like you said, a certain healthy skepticism that a lot of times, even if they were set up for the best of motives, 
the fact that they exist means there are going to be a lot of accretions. Things are going to pile on them. They're going to start, you know, their, their mandates are going to be exceeded in various ways and there's going to be need for reform. That's constant. And I think that would be true of any human institution, you know, a, a national government as well. You know, it may be set up according to the best principles, but depending on who's in charge and how, you know, how things change over time, there's a constant need to be you know, vigilant as to are we, you know, is there mission creep going on here? Um, I think, you know, the, the UN and other international institutions, first and foremost, they're not going anywhere. They will continue to exist and there will always be in a globalized world a need to have a place for nations to come together and, you know, exchange ideas and come to agreement. So that needs to exist at some form. And so first and foremost, we can't not be paying attention. We have to be involved. And there are opportunities for civil society organizations to be involved at the UN. Um, you know, CFAM is accredited with the Economic and Social Council, um, ECOSOC at the UN. So that gives us the ability to, you know, to co-host meetings there, to get passes so we can go into the building and talk to the diplomats. It gives us, you know, the ability to, as members of civil society, have our voice heard, deliver statements, and we do that regularly. Um, you know, again, I think in countries like the U.S. and Canada, the average citizen doesn't have to think about the U.N. on a regular basis. And so we have that luxury. <laughs> but for a lot of the people around the world, the U.N. is really a big deal. You know, I, I remember speaking to a, a young woman who grew up in, I forget exactly which sub-Saharan African country, but, you know, she said that even like the pencils in school, you know, had the U.N. logo on them, that everything, you know, relates back. And so not only for ourselves, but for people around the world who are looking to defend life, we have to, you know, be mindful that we as members of civil society have a voice both in our own national governments and in the international institutions to try and, you know, keep them as much as possible to doing the things they were set up to do. And when they start to creep into other areas or exceed their mandates to call for the necessary reforms. So certainly, you know, even if we think these things are are woefully misguided and, and gone in the wrong direction, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. So we have to at least do what we, what we can do to try and, you know, monitor what they're doing, follow it, spread the word, and be there and bring people in. Because certainly, you know, when it comes to the big gatherings of civil society, you know, the, the people on the other side, they're there in force, you know, mm -hmm. they often see these as their playground. And, it's been very heartening in recent years that every year during the commission on the status of women, they obviously didn't hold it this year because of the, the lockdown, but you know, it's a huge gathering place for both diplomats from capitals as well as civil society people from all over the world. And everyone's hosting events and having discussions. And, you know, we've seen, you know, they, it's been referred to as the backlash, you know, this rise of, you know, very active, very engaged pro-life people, a lot of young people who are there who are asking questions who are, you know, making a, making themselves heard. And so we have to engage in these institutions if we want them to do good things and to, you know, call for reform where necessary. We certainly can't not be there to hear what's going on, you know, and then be surprised by it later. Uh, one question on, on how, how best to push back. So I was reading through a bunch of WHO documents a few weeks ago, and I found this one report um, called Standards for Sexuality Education in Europe, a Framer for Policymakers, Educational and Health Authorities Specialization. Um, and the stuff in there is, is just, it, it really is very vile. Uh, I don't actually, um, I guess it's toward the end of, end of the podcast, so I won't, I won't scare people off. But like they talk about, they talk about teaching kids masturbation below the age of five, uh, introducing gender identity before the age of six. Um, this is this is the standards that, that they're that they're putting out for for educators for people who have access to to children of that age. How do we push back against stuff like like this? Because it's stuff like that that makes people want to burn it all down. Right. Well, I can honestly say that you know members of our coalition at the UN have really um, focused a lot on what they call comprehensive sexuality education or CSE. And this is being done at multiple levels. I mean, obviously, educating the diplomats that when they're negotiating these resolutions at the UN that end up, and again, the, the, the resolutions that the General Assembly negotiates, this is when all the countries come together, right? right. Those are usually non-binding resolutions, but they are, they, they're not, rather, they're not binding on the countries themselves, but they are binding on the UN system. Right. So it is from this that the UN agencies are going to derive their mandate. Now, they may still go outside of that mandate, but that is nominally where they're getting it from. So that it is important what these nations agree to in these documents makes a difference. And a lot of times what happens is the wording that gets into a document has this sort of 
constructive ambiguity. You know, it's, it's a set of words that everyone feels they can come home and say it means what we want it to mean. Right. And so being aware of that, you know, certainly the phrase comprehensive sexuality education is highly controversial in the UN, as is, you know, phrases that are known to be euphemistic for abortion, sexual and reproductive health and, and things like that. And so the more that diplomats are educated as to what this actually means, you show them this uh, guidance that you were talking about and say, this is what happens to the children in your country if you agree to comprehensive sexuality education at the UN. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, certainly educating the diplomats about it and also in capitals, you know, talking to people on the ground, members of civil society, pro-family organizations, educators about what these curricula contain and you know, there have been in many countries protests, you know, of, of citizens and parents and teachers against comprehensive sexuality education that's being foisted on, on children. So, you know, I, I think, again, spreading awareness at all levels is important. Um, there's a role for everyone to do just in terms of getting the word out. That brings me to my, my final question. Uh, just tell our, our listeners and our viewers a little bit about your work and, and the work of CFAM, just to Everything you've been saying, we should we we should do and how to get engaged. That's that is the work that that CFAM does. So maybe give us a little rundown of 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 what it is uh, that you do, what CFAM does, and and then um, a couple of the good news stories might be nice right about now. Sure. Um, well, CFAM uh, has been around since the late '90s. Um, basically, we were founded in part in response to there were some very large gatherings of of nations talking about women's issues and population issues where there was a concerted effort to try and establish a human right to abortion in international human rights law. And there was, you know, Pope John Paul II um, played a very large role um, convening with, you know, Christian countries, Muslim countries, in blocking us. And there was a big call that went out to members of civil society of goodwill to come and be a part of this discussion. So a lot of pro-life leaders, a lot of people came to Cairo, Egypt, where this conference was held, and, you know, they had their voices heard. And it was determined in, in the wake of this that there needed to be sort of watchdogs all the time, you know, not just when big conferences happen, but following the UN, you know, in terms of life issues and family issues and being a part of that process. And so CFAM, basically that's what we do. We focus on international institutions, you know, primarily the UN, but also the EU, the OAS, different regional groups in terms of promoting life, promoting the family and, you know, reporting on how the debate is, is unfolding. You know, so we, we, we work in several ways. We work directly with the diplomats from around the world who are like-minded on these issues and bring them together and um, offer expertise and guidance to them. We also obviously have a reporting role. We write every week. We publish the Friday Facts, which mm -hmm. keeps people up to date on the latest in the debate. Um, and also we do more scholarly work. You know, we go deep into, you know, into the research and that's more where my area is. I'm a, a scientist by training, so... Um, so I'm more on the research side, but yeah, I mean, we're, we have different, um, backgrounds, you know, we've got a, you know, people with legal expertise with, you know, national, international security expertise, scientific. So we're kind of multidisciplinary that way and certainly journalistic as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, we work in a coalition of, uh, pro-life, pro-family organizations. Um, we take part in, you know, in the UN system as civil society can. We co-host events, we bring in experts to testify. We, you know, we host events also um, on the US side. I mean, we are an American based organization. And so we, we work with our own government, um, with pro-life and pro-family members of Congress, with the, you know, administration, if they're like-minded. And so trying to encourage the US to use its position at the UN to promote life and, and the family. And, and we can certainly say that we've had, you know, some very good um, interactions with this, with this administration, you know, in terms of encouraging them and, um, you know, helping make suggestions on language for, you know, resolutions. Right. And well, thank you so much for taking the time to explain all this to us. I really appreciate your time. Ladies and gentlemen, that was my conversation with Rebecca Oss of CFAM. Thanks so much for tuning into the show this week. If you want to check out other shows or be alerted when uh, they uh, are uploaded, you can subscribe to us on YouTube. If you want to read other commentary on Essential Life and Family News, you can do that over at LifeSiteNews.com. Thanks so much for joining us this week, and we do hope you'll join us again next week. Bye for now.